Okay, you guys can go. Okay, we're good. Okay. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody, my name is Jennifer Cook. I am the Small Acreage Management Coordinator for the Front Range in Colorado. This webinar is made possible by CSU Extension and the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. We're excited today to have Nancy Erlbeck with us. She's an associate professor at Colorado State University and talking today about copper and nutritional considerations of hand spinning sheep. But before we get started, I just want to let you know that um, the bottom left hand corner of your screen is the chat box and you can use this to type in your questions or comments that you have for Nancy. You can type them in as, as Nancy presents, but she'll wait until the end to address the comments and questions. And lastly, this webinar will be recorded and will be available on the Small Acres Management website and we'll type in that link in the chat box in just a minute. So I guess we can go ahead and pull up Nancy's presentation and I'll hand things over to Nancy. Thank you, Jennifer. This is Nancy Erlbeck. And uh, I just put this slide here because I took it um, a few days ago after it snowed and it always calms me as I look out. I have a little bit different voice today as uh, I've been spending too many nights in that barn helping with the lambs, doing my lambing. So hopefully my voice will hold as we go through it. But thank you for making time and to come and visit and particularly for our international guests. It's very much appreciated. The, origin of this presentation came about because of a Facebook conversation of all things. One of my good friends, Jared Lloyd, posted this picture and it elicited a, a dialogue between many of us talking about copper deficiency. And what I see in this picture is um, the classic, as scientists would call it, a chromotrichia or the bands of a copper deficiency in a hand spinning fleece. And if I'm not mistaken, this is a Shetland. Um, thank you, Jared, for um, donating the picture off of Facebook so that we could use it. But I think as we go through today's presentation, you're going to find to determine if this is a copper deficiency or not a copper deficiency is not always really cut and dried. And I'm encouraging anyone with uh, questions to please go ahead. There's always a potential if we need to go into a greater depth to do another webinar um, to expand. But this, uh, as an introductory level, I think will do quite well. In all of my presentations that I give, I always use this slide because right here, if one looks, I am the wolf in sheep clothing. And uh, I'm always looking out and I'm not going to give you exactly what you expect. And uh, if I actually cause you to ask more questions, if I, um, if I create a questioning process, I have achieved exactly what I'm wanting to do today. So I always use this slide. I'm going to very briefly give you a little bit of my background so that you know why uh, I'm presenting this. I come from Iowa. I'm a pig farmer's daughter. I grew up on the land in the 50s and the 60s, so that ages me just a wee bit, but always have been around animals. My training is as a ruminant nutritionist, uh, cattle and sheep. By choice, I've become a comparative nutrition with dogs and cats, with um, a little bit of everything. As a com um, comparing the species, I take great joy in looking at the nutrient requirements across those lines. I was a Denver Zoo nutritionist, uh, consulting nutritionist from 1991 to 2013 when I stepped down due to um, work um, responsibilities. But I still um, work closely with the Denver Zoo and one of my students has become the full-time person. So what better life than being uh, followed by a student. I did my sabbatical in 1998 in Australia uh, working with the yellowfoot rock wallaby and radio collared koalas. 
uh, that was a learning experience within itself. I have students living in Alaska, uh, working with the reindeer, um, a captive population here in Fairbanks. Um, Costa Rica, this is in Costa Rica, as a visiting lecture to talk about um, those species, uh, indigenous, and yes, they do have sheep in Costa Rica, as illustrated here in this slide um, in 2009. My newest adventure is starting it with uh, working collaboratively with Wildlife Nutrition Services in South Africa with Craig Shepstone and um, a group of um, zebra, and you can see the rhinos in the back. Uh, if you, I ha see on the screen right now, one person has raised their hand. I'm going to, um, Ellen, is there supposed to be sound? Ruth, can you take care of the sound for Ellen, please? Thank you, Ellen, for raising your hand on the slide. Um, this is our company, or my company, my husband and I, Anna Room Sheep Company. Anna from the Animal, Rue from Kangaroo, and NZ from the years that I spent in New Zealand. It was living in New Zealand that resulted in me coming back to the States and uh, selling my home and buying the land. And uh, within just a few months, I had sheep in the barn. So uh, it was quite... Uh, quite the ride as we've gone along. You'll see the blankets on the animals here in uh, an irrigated pasture. Know that uh, I have people that are not knowledgeable with hand spinning fleeces asking why do you coat all your animals? It's not to keep them warm, it's just to keep the fleece clean. And for all of us that are hand spinners and working with the fleeces, um, definitely can understand that. The sheep breeds that we have at, our, uh, at Anaroons are the Lincoln, which is a long wool. The Wenslingdale is a long wool. The Teeswater is a long wool. The Blue Face Lester I classify as a long wool. Uh, the Ramadale CBM that I have crossed with Merino bloodlines, the Doni Merino bloodlines, Bonds um, are, are my fine wool breed. And then the Caracal, which is the hair breed or one, one of the primitives. I find that as you work with hand spinning individuals, you'll find that they definitely like um, a diversity of product and we try to provide that. I work with youth. This is my joy. Uh, sheep and students. And this is just a group of students several years ago uh, that we snapped a picture and uh, even tonight I have veterinary students um, that will be coming and um, helping us lamb this evening. And maybe I'll get over my cold. And this picture, even the lambs that we sell or that we lose, uh, occasionally we lose one uh, that comes breech, or maybe it's a, uh, laid on by a mother, something happens. And here I have one of my college students teaching a 12-year-old uh, on how to dissect out teaching an anatomy lessons. And so even though we have lost the little animal, we definitely um, try to use everything. Uh, nothing goes to waste. As a nutritionist, as an animal nutritionist, um, particularly comparative approach working across the many, many species, I look at nutrition as a puzzle. And it's impacted by management, um, by the behavior of the animals, by economics, what you can afford to pay and what you can't afford. Uh, for example, I feed hay um, eight months of the year. If I would have to feed hay to my animals 12 months of the year, um, there's just no way that you can do it. And the more time, uh, the more pasture that is available, the more profitable it is. Also, the species makes a difference on nutrition as well as disease and illness, which we're going to talk about today as we work through the, the copper issue. And again, here's our copper deficient slide to lead off. Um, and as a, as a nutritionist, I think uh, using nutrition to treat and prevent disease, nutrition is the key. We need a balanced diet. Uh, the six nutrients, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly uh, as it was meant to be an introductory level. Just um, everything has to be balanced. And if something is askew, we have one nutrient um, deficient, one in excess, all will um, affect the animal's health and well-being. Nutrients are needed in, not only in the right amount, but in the right proportion. And just one uh, item out of... Um, too high or too low will impact the health of that animal. And I love this slide because it drives everybody crazy. And it was out of, uh, in 1994, drawn by pools. It's out of a Canada um, 
subscription, and this is the interactions of minerals. And if you think uh, copper deficiency, copper toxicity is cut and dried, uh, think again, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. I'm going to pick five of the mineral, I'll say, partners in quote or quotations here with copper, those being calcium, zinc, iron, sulfur, and molybdenum. These five other minerals and the interactions along with copper may have a major impact um, in determining if you have a copper deficiency or a copper toxicity. And uh, particularly with hand spinning sheep, they are not uh, as we would see with our uh, typical meat breeds. And hopefully, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with this topic, you'll already be um, intrigued with why we're going to even talk about a copper deficiency in sheep. My first advice is always uh, to get a veterinarian. I have a, a lady that I work with that is phenomenal uh, to help with advice, prescriptions with help. We work hand in hand. Um, my uh, working with my nutritional advice and she with her medical, we make a formidable team. So I like to think that we have a partnership and working hand in hand with a veterinarian will make your copper work uh, much more, um, it'll be easier and also with a diagnostic approach, um, to me it's the only way to go. To give again a uh, kind of an orientation, all mammals need copper, even sheep. They need it for the nervous system, the myelin sheath, the, the, the sheath that covers those nerves. And as we go through these, uh, and then we'll look at deficient symptoms uh, as seen in sheep of being deficient in copper, you'll find that they link back to some of these needs. Um, copper is needed for the structural component with the collagen and elastin. It's need for iron metabolism working hand in hand with uh, production of hemoglobin. Uh, if you have an anemic animal, it may be a copper deficient, not iron uh, deficient. Copper is needed for the coloring, and this is where we start moving towards the emphasis on the hand spinning fleeces. Uh, copper is needed in melanin production, melanin being the coloring pigment found in hair and in skin. Um, copper is needed very, uh, very much so, and why our hand spinning fleeces may actually have higher copper requirements than what our typical meat breeds would be. Uh, the enzyme systems in the body that work with the immune system, uh, that work in the reproductive process, and many others. So copper is definitely essential, but as many of us have learned the hard way, it can be very, very quickly become toxic. I always use this slide. It was in, uh, done in 1969, um, and as a true ruminant nutritionist, the more pictures I can show, to help me understand, I'm a visual learner, we look at the types of ruminants and feeding a cow is definitely not the same as a sheep. Um, if you look at this classification, you'll see the cow on the right hand side under the grass and roughage eater. Uh, the concentrate selectors like the white-tailed deer, uh, moose, I put sheep almost into the intermediate, not uh, along the line between concentrate and intermediate, maybe around, uh, not quite to the goat, but that's where they fit. And that helps me as I put uh, rations together in determining what animals uh, would need to be fed. We need to keep in mind that this is a ruminant and everything that we feed is going to be impacted by the rumen microbes. This is an electron microscopy slide of rumen microbes attached to little hay particles. And uh, as a ruminant nutritionist, I'm always incredibly intrigued with um, looking at them up close and personal, as we see in here. Again, the examples of long wools, and I've added, or of wool breeds, I've added uh, the Lincoln, the Wenslingdale Teeswater, the Blueface Lester, uh, the Ramadales, as I have. I also added Jacobs, Shetlands, uh, Rambouillet, and others. There are many wool uh, breeds, the Icelandics, I don't have that listed. Um, we have a lot of churro breeders. Uh, some consider churros the wool breeds too, as you look at the Diné, the Navajo peoples. And uh, the examples of some of the long wools, let me see if I can get my pointer to work here. Here it comes. Oops. My pointer doesn't want to work. 
Well, in the left upper left-hand corner, you'll find uh, this is a Teeswater. It, oh, there it is. Thank you, Ruth. This one right here with that little green arrow, that's one of my Wenslingdales. And the Wenslingdales come in dark colors. Um, they're black, they're gray. I actually have three more at, or red-brown um, Wenslingdales um, in my flock right now. And here is my Lincoln, my bossy Lincolns. I love the Lincolns. Um, have a very strong UK, UK influence um, as we just um, brought in, uh, or several years ago, brought in a tank with the semen from th three um, Lincoln Rams from the UK. The next slide shows the fine wools. These are some of my Ramadel CVMs with a merino influence right before we sheared. And you can see that they're about ready to pop out of their blankets. Uh, these girls, when I sheared them uh, just a few, about a month ago, had a four to six inch staple. The fleece, I worked very, very hard to get a long staple and to lower the micron count. As I feed my fine wools, and for those of you who have uh, also worked with the fine wools and have a lot of sheep experience, fine wools can indeed be very, very challenging. Uh, they uh, are very prone to any change in the diet. Their fleece is going to be impacted. If there is a major stress in the animal or if the animal becomes ill, when we sh after we shear it, we will find that we'll have a break or a change in that fiber just because of uh, a plane of nutrition or other incident on the animal. Whereas my long wool's uh, diet changes, and they're, uh, they bounce right back. But the fine wool's tend to be, at least in my management systems, a little bit more um, um, temperamental. And uh, under the chat history, I'm seeing that Gotlands and Romneys and Black Welsh Mountains are also listed as wool breeds. Thank you for uh, adding those to it. I like the Gotlands in particular because if I'm not mistaken, um, in The Hobbit and uh, in that series, all of those capes, the elven capes, were made from Gotland fiber. Moving on, um, these are, or this is a picture of some club lambs. If you are here to learn about the club lambs uh, or the meat breeds, uh, everything that I'm going to tell you is not true here. Um, if you feed these animals the levels that I feed, the levels of copper that I feed my flock, my hen spinning flock, you'll kill them. When I was in graduate school uh, way back when in the dark ages, one of the other graduate students as they were formula formulating the diet moved the decimal in the copper and killed off all of our research flock. Uh, copper is lethal to most sheep. And uh, the rest of the talk today, I'm going to show you why, or at least to cause a questioning process within the hand spinning uh, copper requirements. This right here, I skirted along with my colleague, uh, Jennifer Geyer. We were skirting a Ramadale CVM fleece with a bond influence. And when I looked at this, and particularly as I looked at the bands uh, that are going across, I immediately thought that this was a um, copper deficiency. But the fiber is strong. The crimp is there. It's definitely not a copper deficiency. Uh, this is just the change in the plane of nutrition. The very large band there, I am assuming, is when I brought them in from pasture. They were on pasture all summer. And when I brought them in um, and put them on uh, hay in the enclosure, I'm assuming that's the, the lower part of the growth. So this is not a copper deficiency. So I have to caution you, just because you have bands on your uh, fiber does not always mean it is a copper deficiency. And compare that here, uh, the nutritional change of my uh, Ramadale bond um, fine wool and uh, with Jared's um, Shetland definitely copper deficiency and so you can see a little bit of difference Jared's is much more bleached out and the classic what we call a chromo 
trichia or its lack of light, lack of color. So this is where things are really going to start getting interesting. When we talk about copper in our sheep, we have to look at all of the copper. And that means not only in, uh, in a supplement, but we look at the forage, whether that forage is a hay, whether it is pasture, uh, what is copper is available or not available. We have to look at the water. Many people forget about the water, and it may not so much be the copper in the water, but other elements in it, and so that's coming. And then the supplement, if we're going to be feeding a supplement to support that animal in its nutrient requirements, that supplement too can impact um, the uh, copper in the forage and in the water and then provide the animal as a source or provide the copper as a source to the animal. So I call these the copper challenges. These are the five, um, as I put this together, that I could narrow down the reasonings uh, on how copper can be a challenge to my hand spinning flock. And the first one is a physiological status. And that means, is it growing? Is it uh, producing milk for, the, for its babies? Is it at maintenance? It's just growing a fleece. It's a weather. Um, the physiological status. The second is the soil and water, more the geographical reason. And uh, there are those um, right now, for example, in Europe, I, I can't advise you as well as I could potentially advise those that are in Colorado. And uh, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit more. In forages, the type, the source, the quality, and the age of the forages, the mineral supplement, and then the species of animals, and even the breeds. There's definitely breed differences within um, our hand spinning flocks. And there's much research. I want to preface this. There's much research that needs to be done. Um, maybe in the next few years, it's uh, potential before I retire. I would like to help delineate the answers to some of these. Uh, what is the true copper requirement for a hand spinning flock of a specific breed versus our typical meat breeds that um, most of the literature has been done on. So let's look at physiological status. The copper requirement in all the textbooks uh, based on the meat breeds um, predominantly, there are some wool breeds, merino influence in that, is 8 to 11 parts per million. Parts per million or milligrams per kilogram. But 8 is for the animal at maintenance, uh, 10 to 11 as you increase nutrient requirements for growth or lactation uh, if the animal is, if a ewe is producing milk. And it is said in all of the textbooks, and uh, as I've taught in my nutrition class, if you feed 25 parts per million, it's toxic to sheep. But I have to tell you that here in Colorado, uh, in my hand spinning flock, in my location, in my management system, I add libidum feed or it's available to them at all times, a cattle mineral that has a 400 parts per million copper. Um, and people are starting to roll their eyes and they say, lady, what are you doing? But let's go on and let's see the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. This is um, a slide or a picture delivered to the lower right-hand side that's actually from one of the European data sites uh, of a liver that has been overcome with copper. The liver in the sheep is unique in the fact that it cannot excrete copper very easily. It tends to grab a hold of it and hold on and, uh, and keep collecting and scavenging all of the copper that it can. When it gets full and no more copper is online, it's like everything blows up. I'll just be quite simplistic. Uh, and it starts excreting in high levels and destroying all of the metabolism, uh, breaking uh, hemoglobin, damaging red blood cells, and ultimately resulting in the animal's death. You can see a kidney in the upper right-hand side, the discoloration. The uh, sheep that I have to the left, the Texel breed, is in all of the literature that I have searched, is the species or is the breed of sheep that is most sensitive to copper toxicity. And so you'll see that the merino is more intermediate. My fine wool influence is more intermediate in susceptibility. And the fin sheep seems to be most resistant. So for those of you with uh, 
Um, with the Finn, it's much less of a worry than it is with many other breeds. And Dr. Van Meter from Colorado State University, this is one of his slides. Excuse me, is uh, shows the discoloration of the eye or a jaundice. Uh, remember that in an animal suffering from copper toxicity, it starts dumping all of the copper, destroying, destroying the red blood cells, and you see the resulting uh, yellow color, the jaundice, in the eyelids. Um, and thank you, uh, Van, Dr. Van Meter, for that, that slide. As we look at physiological status, uh, you'll find that growing animals have a higher requirement for copper. Those that are uh, the first two-thirds of um, gestation, uh, in a 150-day gestation, I break it into three 50-day increments. And the uh, first 50 days and then the next 50 days or 100 days, we have a lower copper requirement than we will in the last 50 days. And it's interesting, I give a lot of talks on fiber quality and feeding for fiber and the impact of nutrition on increasing fiber quality. And this also plays within the, the copper requirement. So we can see, same as in the fiber development, in, in those follicle development, the higher copper in the last third of uh, gestation, as well as in lactation, and less for the animals that are at maintenance, uh, just spending time dry lotted or waiting until breeding time. Just a picture of uh, some of the little, there's a mostly Lincolns there, there is one Wenslingdale there, but a group of uh, animals around the feed bunk, the little guys having the higher copper requirements than the dams, even though they're lactating. Now this is where it's going to get a little bit more sticky. And particularly if you're from the UK, uh, if you're from Maine, if you're from California, um, everyone is going to be different. The soil and water, the geographical factors as we look at copper and how we feed our hand spinning fleece, because soil types vary. Uh, they're different all across the US. Sorry, I didn't put a world map there, but uh, the same would be true as we go along. It's know the land, know the soil. And this is a big molybdenum mine uh, here in Colorado when it was open. It has now been closed. A lot of ecological damage from that mine. But this high level of molybdenum, and you can see the drainage area here in Colorado, has a probably a significant factor in the reason why I am feeding a cattle mineral, a high level of copper, to my hand spinning fleeces, if I do, or hand spinning sheep, if I do not feed that level of copper, I definitely see a response in the fleeces, and I see a response in the health of the animals. And so this will give you, um, a, helps delineate um, some of the differences here in Colorado. This is a picture of an Angus cow. I know it is not a sheep, but uh, grazing a pasture in western Colorado, and it looks like it's muddy and it's got a little white colored hair, that is classic copper deficiency. And so in all of my species, whether I'm working with the domestic or the wildlife species, um, companion animals, I always maintain a 10 to 1 copper to molybdenum ratio. So you have to look at the fiber, the forage source, you have to look at the water, you have to look at the supplement. In fact, in some cases where the soils may be high in copper, Molybdenum is added to the diet to help tie up the copper. It's uh, to slow the metabolism rate and prevent it from being uh, absorbed into the gut. I've been told and I've had, uh, well, and I'm aware that some individuals uh, will give copper boluses, uh, little copper particles that are in a gelatin uh, capsule will bolus their animals with copper. And as it goes into the abomasum, into the low gastric pH, uh, it will slowly oxidize that copper, slowly releasing it. I've never thought of doing that with my sheep. Um, it scares the dickens out of me because I can't quantify the amount. Um, and if I have animals eating ad lib cattle mineral, I can't really quantify that either. But um, this, um, I can pull the mineral away from my sheep. It's kind of hard to get these copper rods out of the animal's uh, rumen, though uh, in some uh, scenarios I know for a fact that uh, this is the only way that they can 
uh, protect uh, the animals from copper um, deficiency. Okay, um, I put this slide here because uh, as animal nutritionists, we ha add high levels of copper to poultry and to hog diets. It has an antibiotic-like effect on uh, the animal's health. It helps to thin the gut lining. Uh, the gut is probably the most energy-using organ in the animal's body, and by making that gut wall just a little bit thinner, it's able to absorb the nutrients more efficient. But the problem with doing that is the animal will, if we feed the high levels of copper, they will void out the excess copper into the environment through the feces. And if the manure from hogs or from poultry is spread on a pasture and then sheep graze it, or if the forage is harvested from that pasture or that field and then fed to the sheep, you can easily set up a copper to toxicity scenario. So you need to be aware of what type of animals, what type of manure, and that goes along with the humans. Uh, we're seeing a lot of cities now spreading municipal sludge on top uh, or into fields. Be aware of the heavy metal content of much of this sludge. And uh, it wouldn't be my choice uh, to use a forage uh, from fields that have been spread with this type of, uh, of fertilization. And as I indicated earlier, don't forget the water. Um, as I've worked across the species, this seems to be the nutrient that's most commonly forgotten. And uh, that water content will definitely have the impact on copper metabolism as we move forward because the intake of the water is three to five times more than the dry matter intake of the animal. This slide right here I use to depict, I live uh, south of Cheyenne, Wyoming. I'm in Colorado, but I have a 760 foot well. And one of my greatest, one of my frustrations is I go through dishwashers very quick. My water is very hard, and even if I use the rinses and follow all the instructions, my glasses, uh, all of my glassware come out with white skim on it because of the high calcium uh, in my water. Again, that high calcium in the water may be the reason why I can get away with feeding cattle minerals at 400 parts per million to my sheep. I, so not only the molybdenum impact, but the high calcium. So you need to look at your water source. Uh, do you have a high iron in your water? Do you have sulfur, um, particularly the thiomolybdates that can be created by the sulfur and the molybdenum and the impact on copper um, is incredibly intriguing. Let's go look at the forages quickly, the type, the source, the quality, the age of the forage. Uh, up in the lower or in the right hand corner, um, I have a first cutting alfalfa, a third cutting alfalfa. Uh, maybe that's food for thought for another webinar to talk about different forages for different sheep in different parts of the world. Uh, I have a very mature um, Timothy in the right hand side and um, in a grazing scenario in the upper uh, right. So different forages, forage types. Uh, if you're going to feed uh, hay that's been sitting in the um, elements, that is the nutrients have been bleached out, how you supplement the animal feeding this forage, if they'll eat it, is a whole heck of a lot different than if you had a newly harvested that's been stored in a barn. Getting your feed sampled, uh, we're going to talk about that. Uh, if you have 10 sheep, can you afford to sample your feed? If you have 1,000, I don't think you cannot feed without it. So, And where is the dividing line therein? So we'll talk a little bit about feed sampling. Um, just a picture again of the first cutting and third cutting alfalfa. Uh, I feed mine, uh, all of my sheep, a second cutting. I also use corn stover, corn stalks. Uh, ad libitum for them to chew on. Uh, they, uh, I limit uh, the alfalfa, otherwise they get way too fat. And so that's what economically works for me. This is a good quality grass hay. Um, grass hay, at least in my area, is incredibly expensive and is bought up by the uh, horse people. So going back, it is more economical. Going back to my nutrition puzzle as, that I had talked about, it's more economical for me to feed alfalfa with corn stover 
than it is to feed grass uh, to my, my hand spinning flock. And again, remember the molybdenum content in my forages is probably quite high. Now, how are you going to get those chemical analyses done? And this may be some of the questions. Um, I can see that there's more questions coming in. Thank you for that. But NIS, NIRS is near infrared reflectance spectrophotometry. It's a near infrared analyses versus the chemical lab. And you can immediately know what it is on the price. You'll find the NIRS uh, near infrared reflectance is probably going to be under 100. Chemical labs always over 100 or close to it uh, because of the time, the chemicals that are needed. Concern I have with the NIRS um, is many of the feed companies have acquired NIRS, the near infrared spectrophot uh, spectrophotometers, and say that if you buy feed from me, I'm going to analyze your um, forages for free. Uh, however, they're not always trained in the calibration of the machine, and we have a lot of faulty errors uh, inherent within that. So you need to be aware. Uh, ask them if they calibrate their machine and what kind of training have they gone through. <laughs> Moving on next to the mineral supplement and the impact on the hand spinning fleece. Um, I put this little cartoon here. Now if I add this supplement and then I add this supplement, this is something that I see with sheep people. I see with, excuse me, my voice is tiring here. I see with a lot of uh, particularly new individuals as they uh, start working with animals, they, let's say someone has boar goats or has Icelandic sheep and they have a red uh, ribbon, blue ribbons and you want it too. So you ask what supplement are they feeding and then uh, you'll feed that same supplement. And I see people piling supplement on supplement over and too many supplements can create many, many issues. And so you look at what is being provided by the forage, the predominant part of the diet, and then use your supplement to make the complete profile. And uh, how you do that with a small flock versus a large flock varies. All of the literature tells you do not use other uh, species minerals. I have the horse in the upper left hand. We use copper to prevent uh, some of the leg issues, um, laminitis. The dairy cow, we use copper not only in foot bass to, pre uh, to prevent uh, hoof issues. We use copper as some of the wormers, and we add high levels of copper in hog diet. So just feeding or having our sheep around these other species may be impacted. I use this slide just um, that I borrowed from um, the Utah uh, State University Extension, just to tell a little bit of a story. I like to tell stories. Um, I had a ton of feed that we picked up from um, our local mill and found a few years back and uh, never looked at the tags. I have my own formula. I just assumed that it was my formula. Come to find out uh, they had loaded the wrong feed and I fed over a ton of calf supplement. And calf supplements are notoriously high in copper and I thought, oh dear lord, probably any one other flock, any meat flock, it would have probably killed all of the lambs. I got lucky. And uh, just to show the picture of a couple of my little caracals, the only lamb that I lost out of that whole grouping was one of the little caracals. I did have the analyses done on the liver. Um, I took it into the CSU diagnostic lab and it was just into the very, very high range. I had a couple poor doing animals, but all in all, even though I fed over a ton of that high level copper diet, I was able to save most of the animals, though there definitely was an economical impact. So check your labels and just a picture of some of the babies uh, in the feeding area. Now species and breed, let's talk about that. Um, here, again the Shetland from Jared, the copper deficient is what we've defined. I took this from Google Images, uh, copper deficiency signs is anemia. Remember we talked the need of copper working with uh, iron, uh, reduced growth rate, connective tissue, uh, the collagen, the elastin, 
uh, generalized osteoporosis with the need for copper and bone uh, formation, susceptibility to disease, uh, a lot of diarrhea. They're more prone if you have uh, their immune system is compromised. Uh, the sway back, you can see the lamb in the picture. The depigmentation uh, of the skin, the hair or wool, as you're seeing on the right-hand side in the lower and in Jared's slide that we saw, and the loss of the crimp, steely or stringy wool. This is where we as uh, hand spinners, uh, uh, hand spinner flocks, are concerned. Definitely an animal that dies is going to be a concern. But uh, one can see very clearly how copper is used, and then if it's not there, what's, what's going to happen. My fine wools, again, the merino is intermediate for the copper toxicity. They're harder to feed. The fine wools are impacted by every change that you make, every management change, uh, your nutrition puzzle that we used, one of the first slides, um, everything that is done to this uh, segment of my, uh, of my flock is going to be impacted and copied into, if you could use that picture, photographed into the fiber. And so a little bit more uh, management emphasis being taken. This is one of my lambs, one of my Ramadale CVMs. I've had some people tell me these are Rocky Mountain Merinos. And I thought he looked uh, si significantly uh, sophisticated enough to be a Rocky Mountain Merino there. Let's hope my voice holds just a little bit more. We're almost there. My long wools here is a Teeswater Wenslingdale cross. Um, you have, uh, I shear mine every six to seven months, sometimes eight months, depending on the animal, and I get anywhere from a five to an eight inch staple. If it's a colored animal, you're going to have a greater copper requirement than uh, the white, but even when you have that much uh, production of wool, you have a greater copper requirement than you do with my fine wools. And if we, if I flip back here to my fine wools, I share these guys once a year, just once a year, with the four to six inch staple, shooting for the four inch for the hand spinners, but with these long wools one and a half times a year is on average uh, that I'm sharing with them. So a greater copper requirement uh, is inherent within the long wool animals. And this is just a picture I pulled off the internet of a teaswater, and you can see the, the locks will go to 15, 16, and keep growing, so the greater copper requirement. And this is really uh, interesting to me, and it kind of fits in with some of the feeding for fiber talks that I have. Uh, again, from uh, Google Im Images, if you have a copper deficient skin, the pigmentation, the change that occurs in the hair follicle, in the wool follicle, is going to impact the color and production of your fleece. And tyrosine, which is one of our dietary non-essential amino acid, is converted to melanin, but it needs copper in that step. So for copper deficient, that shows then we don't get the coloring of the beautiful black Wensleydale fleece or the beautiful grays in the Lincolns. Uh, we need copper for that process to occur. So the higher copper requirement. And again, uh, the Teeswater, Wensleydale, and Lincolns that I have here, uh, having to use AI, laparoscopic artificial insemination, to get my bloodlines to build up the genetics, bringing the semen in from uh, Europe. Uh, I guess I want the best fleece that I can get and use in my management system because of uh, the expense of doing that. My blue face lusters, I dearly love. Um, I like producing what we call the mules or what I've been taught by my European friends. You cross them with a uh, Wenslingdale or a Teeswater or a Lincoln and you get a F1 cross, a cross between that has great hybrid vigor. Uh, as I was doing my research online, I could not find anything specific, excuse me, on the wool breeds for either deficiency or toxicity. But in many of the death pictures I saw, I saw blue face lusters. And so I may have to actually pull my blue face lusters out of the rest of the flock and feed them separately because I have seen some issues. Uh, 
And as I think, and as I've been doing this research, it may be linked back to that cattle mineral I'm feeding. So definitely, there are breed differences, but we don't know. And I can't tell you how the black Welsh mountain sheep, and I can't tell you the copper requirements for the Jacobs. Uh, that research has not been done. And as I've gone through the talk, uh, there's many factors, and we have to delineate it on a case-by-case -case basis to tell. Now, uh, if you do lose an animal or if you're suspecting a deficiency or a toxicity, the hair is, does it work? Uh, care, pulling blood uh, serum or whole blood is the way to do the analyses. And again, these pictures will be online so you can have it. I took them off of Google Images, but it's from a pharmacological site uh, that you could go back and find. The best analyses, the most uh, reputable, is going to be your liver biopsy. Now, let me tell you a little bit about liver biopsies that I've found as I've worked cross species, particularly within the zoo world. If you are working with a veterinarian uh, to do the liver biopsies on a living animal, uh, it can be very painful, and that individual uh, needs to be uh, cognizant of what they're doing because the co copper level from the outside of the lobe of the liver and the inside of a lobe is going to vary. And so if you're going to compare your results, you need to sample the same place in the liver at all times. Now the easiest way is if you have an animal that has uh, been harvested or you've lost is just to take the whole liver in. But again, uh, to emphasize to take your liver sampling from the same site, otherwise your results can be very easily skewed. And then uh, the slide shows using enzymes uh, for some of those analyses too. I prefer the serum or the blood or liver biopsies. And as we kind of come to the end here so that we can take questions, what are some of the um, other points of interest with a hand spinning flock? Uh, make sure you take care of your parasite load. Uh, that will definitely uh, have an impact on your nutrient requirements. And uh, many of the wormers we use are copper-based, so be aware of that. And this is a flock from Costa Rica that was having uh, severe parasite loads. Uh, what are you feeding in your creep? What are you feeding to your babies? Uh, what other kind of animals are going in your creep feed? Uh, there's many questions uh, that go along with that. And I'm finding with the hand spinning uh, flock owners, there's a lot of emotion involved. Uh, one of my uh, former students uh, leaving to go to college now, but sitting here and just the love and emotion uh, sometimes gets in the way of us making wise decisions. And we want to treat that animal. We want to do everything that we can possibly do to have the best fleece, the best health. Um, sometimes we have to stay, take a step back and uh, to be realistic in our uh, emotional decisions. Uh, behavior. My good friend Temple Grandin, she and I worked together on many projects uh, within the livestock industry and in the zoo world, and she's, we're going to be going to South Africa to do a lot of the wildlife nutrition now. But the behavior of the animal, what I tell all new owners, and as I work with new flocks, I find uh, you need to learn what is normal. Uh, for the animal. How can you tell something is wrong, that uh, you have a, a disorder, you have a deficiency, you have a toxicity, you have a parasite issue, if you don't know what is normal? My little lambs, they love to play. If they're not bouncing and pronging around, we make them little toys, whether it's with bales, as you see in here. We have some empty tanks, and you can hear them just rat-a-tat-tat playing on their toys as they're going along. We actually even put uh, big mountains as we've cleaned out the yards. We put in big mountains of uh, the manure as we moved it out, and it goes through a composting process. And I have seen my lambs jumping up and down on the top of that big compost heap, that big manure pile, and it's nice and warm because of the heat coming from it. And they just bounce. So if they're not bouncing, if they're not playing, uh, I know something's wrong. So learn what's normal. And if you look out and everybody's crashed like this, no, they're not sick. They're sleeping. They've been running and playing, and they'll just drop, plop, and they're flat. That's normal.
All right. So uh, last slide. What do I do? Do I need to analyze my feeds? How do I find out the minerals in my area? How do I supplement? And now I'm afraid to feed my sheep because I'm going to do something wrong. Don't do that. Don't do that. Do you need to analyze your feed? Uh, if you have 10 animals, if you have just a couple animals, I don't think you can afford to, uh, unless you have very deep pockets. Uh, you don't have large enough quantities uh, to go through uh, that process and what I would do is to talk with a nutritionist potentially uh, at a local uh, feed mill talk with uh, the person you bought your animals from in the same area so that you kind of know of the minerals in the area what works and what doesn't work uh, find a good mentor to work and advise you that's the best way if you have more animals uh, we have 104 breeding animals, and I need to know what the nutrient analyses. I'm a nutritionist, so I'm anal retentive that route, too. So I do the analyses. So I know what's in my feed. I know that there's I may make sure that I maintain at least that 10 to 1 copper to molybdenum uh, ratio. I feed high levels of vitamin E. I've done a lot of research with vitamin E, and as an antioxidant, um, as the vitamin E moves along, I've done that in my formula. So I think with the larger groups of animals, uh, you need to do that. As far as water analyses, if it's on the same water as you, I think you can justify um, analyzing, getting your water analyzed. If you're in the Colorado area around Colorado State, you can get uh, your water very are analyzed in our soil testing lab quite easily. And there are several other places to do. Uh, how do I find about the minerals in my area? Well, if you're good with the computer, it doesn't take real long, or a local extension agent, a local NRCS, uh, National Research Conservation Service. It used to be SCS when I worked for them way back in the 70s, uh, but now it's NRCS. We'll know um, from their uh, soil testing the mineral profiles they'll have, and um, you'll be able to get those answers. And so how do you supplement? Again, that's based on the minerals that you find in your area and the forage that you're feeding. Uh, maybe if you can co-op. Uh, maybe if you're if there's 10 small flocks, you can go together and buy all your feed and do the analyses together. There's a lot of ways to approach that. And once you know uh, what's in the forage, because that's the predominant part of the diet, then you can build a supplement to easily match your forage and every load of your forage. And so it works quite well. Am I, are you afraid to feed your sheep? I hope not. Um, I love my sheep. Uh, they are my passion. I love showing them uh, to the youth and uh, trying to interest. Even my grandbabies come help me with the sheep. So I hope I've stimulated some questions, and I'm going to ask Jennifer to come in and to help coordinate just a little bit with some of the questions. Jennifer? Sure. <clears throat> Ruth, would you mind pulling up the chat box so we can see it full screen? Do you want me to read you the question? Yes, or? please. Okay. Colds are not good for webinars. <laughs> so it's a good thing you can't see my red nose. Okay, here, I can do this. The first one, do you agree with Pat Colby Mineral Program? What form of vitamin E and what about the chelated minerals? Um, I have read a little bit about the Pat Colby. Um, I have it in my packet of information. Um, I would have to go back through it and read it before I uh, read it again before I could answer that. Um, so I'm going to wing that one, but I can work directly with Jennifer and give you an answer as we talk. Uh, the next question, what was the next question there? I just scrolled up to the top. So okay, now we're well, done. let's go back to finish oh. that one's questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, she had another part of the question there. Okay. I, what their name was. Uh, I thought it was a pat. Okay, let's just go back to the top and we'll start then. We'll go through quickly. Um, those are the wool breeds that they were adding. Where can you get water tested for minerals other than human safety ones? Um, that, I don't know where you are, Ogi, but I hope I said your name You're right. In Colorado. You're in Colorado, Jennifer told me, Jennifer Tucker CSU. told me, at CSU in the soil testing lab. Um, Let's see, what's the next one? I found that I could not 
find anyone who can interpret my test results and advise me. Uh, I don't know, Kim, if you could let me know, is that on the forage or if that is on uh, the water? Uh, I could answer that a little bit better. I use a sheep nutritionist and we test forages and get a custom mineral. Perfect, Ogie. Uh, Cross-reference with liver assays of butcher stock. Perfect. Uh, I know my good friend Jennifer Tucker. Every animal that she harvests or if they lose, um, they have a running tally tally of liver biopsies and again kudos to her um, my only caution is to make sure that you test the consistent side of the liver every time because your results will definitely vary where you do that what about mountain breeds from the UK Swaledale um, Welsh Mountain Scottish Blackface where are they on the copper need spectrum I don't know Ogie uh, I can't tell you hopefully we can get the results I've talked to several mineral companies. Um, one of them, um, Micronutrients, that uh, promotes the hydroxy form. And I have promises of, uh, of the mineral if I do the research, but not the rest of the dollars to do the assays, etc. So if we can find the funding, we're hoping to do um, some of those results, but right now it's not here. Uh, what is the relationship between copper or calcium and copper? High copper will tie up um, will tie up um, high calcium will tie up copper what it does is uh, it prevents it from being absorbed into the gut uh, oat hay or new new hay oat hay works well Stephanie um, way over there in brush uh, and your Romneys are beautiful I hope uh, that Mick the ram that you have over there made beautiful babies because he did for me but um, the oat hay be careful uh, how it was harvested. If it was a little in the boot stage, you might find that there, the mold that occurs, uh, you can get some aflatoxin or some nitrate toxicity along with the oat hay. So be careful um, with that. Or new hay is not a problem. Martin Daly is the question by Jeannie Reed. Uh, I don't know what you're asking me about, Martin. Martin uh, has done some AI for me. I also use Glenn Erickson from uh, New Frontier Genetics out of Utah. Stephanie, can a copper deficiency affect a man's sperm? Well, heck in a basket, I'm not sure. Uh, I am assuming that um, if... A ram. Oh, a ram sperm. Okay, I was going <laughs> to say. Um, I am not a reproductive uh, physiologist, but I would say if it is severely deficient, um, potentially, because of the immune system, that long, it will impact it that way. Uh, if you have high levels of copper, the sheep's going to die. So, yeah, it would. Um, in the Arkansas Valley, there is a lot of alkali in the soil. What kind of effect does that have with copper? Stephanie, good question. I will find out. We're, I think we've got another webinar coming up here. Um, there was, if you go back up, I saw that. Do you agree? Yeah. What form of vitamin E, Jeannie? The form that I prefer is a, uh, alpha tocopherol, the... Um, the form that's readily available, that's the form that I like the best. Uh, chelated minerals, uh, you need less of. Uh, you need to use a little bit of finesse. You also have the hydroxy, and uh, much better than uh, um, the inorganic forms. And that's probably why I'm getting by also, because the cattle mineral I feed are all inorganic. But it's working for me. I have beautiful fleeces uh, until I fine-tune it. That's probably what I'll continue. By using the chelates, the hydroxy, or the others, I would use much less. Would you be interested in doing some research on other breeds? Oh, okay, yes. Uh, it's just finding the time and in the funding. Um, where can find someone that can read my test results and then advise me? Um, maybe we can do another, uh, say what, Jennifer? Extension office. Extension office. Yeah, we have a, a three-way. I have Jennifer Cook, Jennifer Tucker uh, helping me here in Adams County. So if you have more questions, um, Michelle Canfield from Washington. I've been testing livers from butcher lambs and call use. I find the bell curve is very wide, many in the middle, some deficient, some too high. Well, heck in a basket. Do you find that that's hard? Yep. Uh, it's hard to optimize the copper requirements for the whole flock. Uh, if it is along the extremes, I think that you're probably right where you need to be. Uh, as I work with my values, I would like to see them clustered more at the top of that bell curve, but I just had uh, one of my Wenslingdales I had to use 
uh, high levels of vitamin E to help bring it around. And I can tell you every single mineral, as I've worked um, dull sheep at the Denver Zoo, uh, I had one that it had higher zinc requirements. Uh, just like people have allergies or deficiencies, you're going to find it in sheep too. And it's just that we get emotionally attached to these animals, and particularly some of them you pay so dang much. But there is going to be differences uh, between individuals as well as between breeds. And uh, a lot of times in the wild, those animals would die. But because we pay so much, we don't want to lose any of them. Um, do you find that, Michelle, again, do you find that copper deficiency contributes to hoof health problems? It can. It can. Uh, because of the elastin connectin, I see more, more like within the joints and the backs, but uh, in osteochondrosis uh, and bone development, uh, I would see more with zinc and some of the et selenium, maybe with hoof problems. Uh, is there a particular part of the liver we should be testing or just the same part every time? Um, I know that when we were in the Denver Zoo, we always did the outer lobe. Uh, I am not uh, diagnostic. I would have to go pull that up. I just know that uh, be consistent every time and um, you'll be all right. Uh, I am in a known low selenium. Diane Swift from California. I'm in a known low selenium and copper area. Flock is mixed frame Suffolk, not Ramadale, Border Leicester, Shetland. The copper deficiency shows up first in the Suffolk, where their black uh, points especially goes brown. Sheep get five cc's, both see, and at breeding, feed is 100% alfalfa from local. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, my cough. Uh, and from local sources and some grain, etc. cetera. Um, I would have to lay out the particulars. I think she said she was from California. Mm -hmm. The soils in California are mucked up. Uh, I would have to look a little more closely. Uh, I know that San Diego Zoo, um, many of the horse people, uh, the enterolists that are created in the intestine or in the large intestine of horses, the mineral profile in California is mucked up. Uh, I would find someone that knows the area where you're working to answer that question. Uh, your BOCI level, I'm hoping you're working with a veterinarian as you need a script in order to um, in order to um, to get that, so I would just work with someone that knows. Do lambs get their copper and they use milk? If we're using goat's milk, how does that affect the copper in the lambs? Uh, the lambs, oh, copper in the milk. I would have to look again um, to see if it comes from the milk. But I, what I can tell you, if the cop, if the ewe is deficient, uh, you're going to see deficient symptoms in the lamb. Um, I'm not sure. I'm assuming then it comes from the milk. I would have to pull that up and look. Uh, I'm going to be a mineral nutritionist by the time we're done. I can tell that. Uh, can I get a copy of some of these so, uh, so that I can yes. go back and answer all of them? Uh, let's go back up here. I wasn't done with her yet. Um, and we're using goat milk. If the goats are being fed the same diet as the sheep, um, I think you would be okay and you would want that anyhow because of the uh, disorders, the um, passive immunity that you get with the newborns, etc., from the area. Um, a sheep can take higher levels of copper than sheep, or goats can take higher levels of copper than sheep. Uh, so you should be fine. That's not an issue. My Nigerian from Diana Swift in California, my Nigerian dwarfs, uh, because otherwise their hair is stiff and brush-like. Well, you know, I've heard people from California that are using that. And that's why I went ahead and put those uh, those small copper boluses in the talk, those little copper rods. I have Nigerian dwarfs, and they're, um, I have them on the same formula as my sheep, and they do just fine. So, But again, the soils in California are mucked up, the mineral profile. What is your thought on selenium to copper or any other um, mineral relationship? Um, Jennifer said... Jennifer, tell me what you're just writing on the board here. Just notes of what you're saying. Oh, she's, she's got notes here. What is your thought on selenium to copper other mineral relationship? Um, I don't know so much the relationship to selenium and copper. If you remember that little um, copper or that little mineral profile with all the interaction, selenium is not one that I looked up. I do know that selenium works in uh, many of the same enzymes uh, as does copper. 
as you look at the structural. Um, and I'm just winging that answer there. I'm going to have to find you out more or find out more for you. We might be able to provide data for you from our flock. We have lots of data. Thank you, Ogi. And Jennifer is nodding her head. She'll get that from you. Diana, if you suspect copper toxicity, is there anything one can do to treat them or to try to save them? Um, the high calcium in water, uh, molybdenum, if you feed them low levels of molybdenum. And again, I would work with a veterinarian and or nutritionist with this. Uh, that can be because the molybdenum and uh, the high calcium can slow that up. That would be the way to do that. Um, Southern San Joaquin Valley, hay from Sanima Valley. Uh, that really doesn't help, Diana, because I'm not, um, I would, again, have to do a search to find out, um, and I would like to learn more. So there you go. All right, what's the next That's one? It. That's it. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, okay, can a copper deficiency look uh, like a vitamin deficiency? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and I will see a copper deficiency that I would swear is another nutrient and vice versa. As I had indicated earlier, there are personal responses. Like if someone has an allergic reaction to strawberries, one person might have uh, a rash, one person might have gastroenteritis, some, another one might have a headache. And you will, that's kind of a gross approach, a large approach to it, but yeah, they do. Uh, in relation to copper, are angora goats similar to fiber sheep or goats? Um, they are much more tolerant, and uh, angoras are much more tolerant to copper than our sheep, though I'm not so sure as we compare our hand spinning flocks, the long wools, and the natural colored sheep, so I'm not sure. Uh, you mentioned BOCI. What do you think about selenium gels? Uh, I have not worked with the selenium gels. Um, I know. Um, when I have bought selenium just to supplement to my sheep, they wouldn't eat it. They just didn't like the taste of it. I thought I could just supplement a little because I was having, I had a load of feed that was way low in uh, selenium. Uh, I, the can, if you could, um, selenium is very easy to go toxic if you can, if you're drenching them uh, so that you can quantify the dose. Uh, I would have to look at the bioavailability of the form uh, of that gel. I don't see any problem if you are in a selenium deficient area. But again, take care uh, because it's very, very easy to overdo selenium. Uh, and sometimes if you're feeding alfalfa, um, high protein from alfalfa will mask uh, a toxic selenium scenario. This, this mineral nutrition... Uh, interacts with everything around the animal, so it is indeed a puzzle. Um, can it look like a thiamine deficiency? Um, and I'm assuming the copper, what I see with the thiamine uh, deficiency is more the stargazing effect, more of a neurological, so uh, thinking as I'm talking, yeah, it probably could. It probably could because of that look in the space. And what's the next one? Thank you all, Looks Stephanie like Zwick. Okay, Ogi, okay, yep, come back. Um, Jennifer is, uh, Tucker asked me, do I want to give out uh, contact information for questions and follow-up specifics? Um, probably the easiest way right now would be to route them through Jennifer Tucker at the Adams County Extension, and we'll get that contact information, and I can reach out to you directly. But that way, they're all kind of pulled together. And uh, But my follow-ups, I definitely will get an answer because I know the best mineral nutritionist in the world, and he's just right at CSU, and I'll, I'll find the answers that I don't know. Uh, Diana Swift would love to learn more. Oh, bless your heart, Diana. Thank you for joining us. Um, Jennifer, uh, her contact information is jennifer.tucker at colostate, C-O-L-O-S-T-A, te.edu and Jennifer Cook just put that online also. Perfect. And yep. yes, Melody, this is, this has been recorded and, and it'll be accessible on the Small Acres Management website. Um, and I'll type that out again for you. We had it at the beginning, but it might have gotten erased. And hopefully, the next webinar I do, my voice will be different. I won't have this cold. But a lambing strikes again, but it's worth every every sneeze.
was just saying thank you. Thank you. We'll hang out for another second to see if um, anyone else has any questions. Thank you all for joining us. <laughs> I saw that. Thanks, neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Good night. From oh, Germany. thanks, Astrid. <laughs> <laughs> There's more at Wensleys. Ah, everyone wants my more at Wensleys. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. So appreciate it. Oh, Ogie, okay. I don't know about the more at Welsh Mountains. We'll talk more. Jennifer knows where you live. You're welcome, Pam. See you, Stephanie. All right. Looks like we don't have any more questions, so we'll sign off. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Have a great day or night. <laughs> or middle of the day. Yeah. <laughs>